God, we are risen with him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
God. Praise God. Praise God. Boy, the thought of being able to run out of a grave, it's hard to even imagine that. You know, as we have spent this this last week, this holy week, perhaps you have been studying the scriptures and all of our attention is brought to Jesus Christ as well it should. It is in that study that we get insight into his followers. You know, every one of them had their struggle. Every one of them had their moments where they they failed Christ. Just like us. Just like us. Boy, I identify with that. You know, and it was it was that one guy, Thomas. You know, he would be tagged if there was a hashtag back then, doubting Thomas. You know, but Jesus went to every one of the disciples after he came out of the grave and even to Thomas who seemed to be the last holdout and yet it was the physical encounter with Jesus Christ that Thomas would declare my Lord and my God you know I don't know where you all are at today in your individual lives Perhaps you've had moments like Peter who spoke before he thought. Or perhaps you had times where you needed more processing time like Thomas. But I would declare to you today that this Jesus Christ who is very, very much alive today and in the lives of his people as we rejoice and sing here this morning. If you are not having a personal relationship with him, he wants to have an encounter with you. If you have the name of someone who's on your heart that you are praying for today, would you signify with the lifting of your hand? You know, there was a day in my history when I was someone's raised hand. I want to encourage every one of you as you're praying this morning, can you continue to pray and don't ever give up? Let's bow our heads. Father, I give you praise. It is with great joy. With great joy with great joy that we welcome your presence into this house. You promised that you would be here. You promised that you would go to the cross. You promised that you would rise from the grave. You have fulfilled every promise. God, you see the needs of your people as we celebrate this Easter season 2024. My God, when I think where you have brought us from to where we are today, I rejoice with every believer here with how you have shown so faithful in their lives. When they've had reason to rejoice, when they've had times of sorrow, God, you have walked with each of us hand in hand. God, I pray that as we continue to celebrate you, Father, I ask that your word would go forth and find a place in each one of our lives where you are leading and guiding us on this journey of faith. God, that your that your name would be made known that Jesus is alive. God, be with us now during this time of worship and celebration. Hear the cries of your people and answer their prayers. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. 
Amen. Let's give the Lord praise together today. Hallelujah. Thank God, thank God. Aren't you thankful today that we serve a risen Savior? Amen. That we serve a Lord who is alive forevermore. We can give Jesus praise today because there's an empty tomb that declares he's alive, he's alive forevermore. Amen. That's the reason the greeting of the New Testament church, when they would greet one another, they would greet one another with this phrase, He is risen, He is risen indeed, amen, He's alive. We give the Lord praise today. It's so good to see you. Man, what a great crowd this resurrection morning. We have had just an incredible weekend together celebrating the sacrifice of Jesus that He made for us, and yet the victory of Jesus in the resurrection. It's so good to have you with us here today. If this is your first time as a guest here at Landmark, we welcome you and we greet you in the name of Jesus. No, I don't normally carry babies with me in the pulpit, but this is my granddaughter, and so we make exceptions for stuff like that. <laughs> Miss Ruthie is all the way here from Ohio, and I'm soaking up every minute I've got with her. And uh, we're so glad to have you here, and we just rejoice with you today in the risen Lord and our hope of salvation, our hope of eternal life that we have in Christ. They're going to place a QR code on the screen here in just a moment. What we'd like to ask you to do is scan that with your phone, and what's going to happen is your phone will populate with one of our Get Connected cards. It's a way for you to leave us a little bit of information, share just a little bit of contact information so we can stay in touch with you and let you know about all the great things that are going on here at Landmark so we can keep you up to date. There's also a function there for our regular attenders as well as our first-time guests where you can leave a prayer request. And I promise you this, if it's important enough for you to leave it as a prayer request, it will be prayed over. We count it an honor to lift up your needs before the throne of grace every single week. Church, would you welcome our guests and let them know how glad we are to have them with us today. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Why don't you take about 30 seconds, get out of your seat, go shake somebody's hand, hug their neck, tell them it's good to see them in the house of the Lord today. Just a few announcements for you this morning, a couple things I want to keep you updated on. I do want to say it is so good to have with us today Jamar Bruner. Jamar serves our country in the Army. Jamar, stand up. Amen. Jamar is active duty military. He is landmark family, and we are so proud of you. Thank you for your service, young man. Amen. So good to have you here today. Also, I want to take a moment just to say a huge thank you 
to everyone who has played such a vital role in everything that has happened at Landmark this weekend. Uh, on Friday night, we had a huge crowd of folks here, and, and I'm thankful for numbers. Numbers are meaningful, right? That's the reason we keep attendance. That's the reason we mark those things. Numbers are meaningful. But what I'm so excited about are the lives that were committed to Christ on Friday night and uh, lives that were changed for eternity. Amen. And Friday night did not just happen. It doesn't happen in a vacuum. It doesn't happen just because you want to. It happens because a lot of great people put a lot of hard work and effort into it. And so just very publicly, as a very, very, very proud pastor, I want to say a huge thank you to our choir and our musicians, all of the singers, everyone who sang and had a part in the program on Friday night. Would you let them know how much you appreciate them? Amen. I had multiple people come up to me Friday night and say, you know what, oh, there go the lights. They didn't say that, but I just was adding commentary there. Um, but uh, I had multiple people come up to me who are not regular attenders here, but this, they just had the testimony. We have never heard a choir sound better than that. Professional choirs anywhere around, we've never heard anything better than that. And I'm just telling you, they were phenomenal. Amen. Yes. And then all of the people who were involved in the drama and the play and everything else, we got the best Jesus anywhere around, Preston, I mean, I, you know, and uh, all the other people who made that happen, all of the makeup coordinators and, and costume makers and all the people who participated in the drama, we couldn't do it without you. You guys knocked it out of the ballpark. Would you let all of them know how much you appreciate them? Amen. And then our media team and AV team who ran lights and, and did all of the broadcast and the camera work and all that, headed up by our youth pastor, Pastor John, all of those guys did an amazing job and just, just did such a wonderful, would you let them know up in the AV room how much you appreciate them? All of our cameramen and all the people who ran the cameras. And then our in-house sound run by Jeff Owen did just such a marvelous job. We appreciate our sound team and all of the people there. And as I said Friday night, I'm just telling you things like this don't happen without great leadership. Any organization, any endeavor rises and falls on the leadership that is provided. And I'm so thankful that we have just absolutely, in my opinion, the best minister of music in the Church of God right here at Landmark, Alicia Owen, our minister of music. Let her know how much you appreciate her did just a phenomenal job of coordinating this and leading it, and uh, my goodness, we are so blessed. We are so blessed, and uh, just incredibly proud, proud pastor moment, and uh, so thankful for everyone who participated, everyone who had an active part in this weekend. I also want to say a huge thank you to Tina Stevens and the ladies who helped set up the fellowship hall. How many of you enjoyed breakfast this morning? Let them know how much you appreciate their efforts this morning. And as always, if you have the opportunity, go buy Daylight Donuts and say a big thank you to, uh, I I'm sorry, Mom, she, I, I tried to keep it in there as long as I could, and, and she got it out, and she's happy about getting it out too, but uh, um, go by and see Jody and Mike at Daylight Donuts and let them know how much you appreciate them. They were up at 3 o'clock this morning fixing fresh donuts, making fresh donuts so that we would have them here at Landmark. And uh, just so appreciative of them. So uh, if you have the opportunity, stop by there and let them know how much you appreciate them and what a blessing they are to us here at Landmark. Also want to let you know uh, we'll be having our new members class coming up. There is a sign-up sheet out in the foyer on the guest information table. If you are interested in uniting with this local body in membership, we want you to sign up and we'll follow up with you and get you all of the information concerning membership here at Landmark, our new members class. And uh, so if you're interested in that, please sign up and we'll follow up with you.
with you. Also, I want to give you an update. I know many of you have asked about my mom. Uh, we are getting close to the finish line. Tuesday, they have scheduled the surgery uh, for her, and uh, we would certainly appreciate your prayers on Tuesday as they go in and uh, perform the surgery that they have uh, gotten her lined up for. Uh, we don't know the time yet. We won't know that until tomorrow, but uh, her surgery is on Tuesday. We appreciate everyone who has prayed up until now, and uh, we, we would appreciate your prayers on Tuesday. And like I said, she wins either way. She's watching right now. She's not going to like me saying that because she fully intends to live and prove the doctors wrong again. And so, uh, she, <laughs> but uh, she wins either way. And so, uh, we, we appreciate your prayers. If you would stand with me. <laughs> we'll get it in a minute. We're going to worship the Lord in giving this morning. I love what the book of Proverbs says in chapter 10, verse 22. The wisest man who ever lived had this to say about what money is all about and what blessing is and, and it, what really it is to be happy in the Lord. He said, the blessings of the Lord make one rich, and he adds no sorrow with them. Now, I've met a lot of rich people who were miserable. I really have. I've let a, met a lot of people with money that were the most unhappy people on earth. Money will not make you happy. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, it will not. It will not add satisfaction to your life. You want to preach? It will not add contentment to your life. <laughs> it will not add joy to your life. But the blessings of the Lord will add all of that to your life. Amen. <laughs> and so what we want to be here at Landmark is we want to be blessed people. It doesn't matter how much money you've got. If you're not blessed, you've missed it. It doesn't matter what your bank account says. If you're not blessed, you've missed out on what God's desire for your life is. He wants to prosper you. He wants to bless you. But he wants you to walk in the blessings of the Lord because in God's blessings, there's no sorrow. Amen? And so that's what we desire. We want to be blessed of the Lord. How do we do that? Well, we honor him. We're faithful and obedient to his word. And we do exactly what God's word says, that we place him first, right? We seek first the kingdom of God. And then all of these other blessings follow that. This morning we're going to do that as we honor the Lord in giving today. Would you take your offering in your hand and we're going to pray over it here in just a moment. We have the offering receptacles that are placed at all the exits. You can give on your way out of the service this morning. If you want to give online, that option is also available. You can give through PayPal, our website, or Stripe, whichever works best for you. But we just want to make sure we honor God and we place Him first. Amen. Let's pray together over the offering today. Father, we love you today. God, I'm so grateful and so thankful for your love. God, I just thank you so much on this resurrection morning for the opportunity not only to worship with my family of faith with our hands lifted and our voices raised, but also to worship in giving today. I pray your blessings over every person under the sound of my voice. And God, you would meet their needs, that you would minister to them, that you would make up the difference in every area of their lives as they walk in the blessings of the Lord. Father, I pray that you would take this offering that's being given, anoint it and consecrate it, use it for the kingdom of God that others would be blessed through your people's faithfulness. We give you all the glory and all the praise today, for it's in the mighty and the wonderful, the holy name of Jesus that we pray, and amen and amen. God bless you as you're being seated. Worship with the choirs. They come this morning, and uh, I'm going to take this little beautiful girl back. Not that we ever uh, compete over that, but... Uh
Jesus, 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 what a fullness Jesus. of his Godhead bodily, Jesus. he is the image Jesus. of the invisible God, Jesus. our Sabbath, our rest, Jesus. the word made flesh, Jesus. prophet, priest, and king, Jesus. unto you we sing, Jesus. in him dwell the fullness Jesus. of the Godhead bodily, Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, our Sabbath, our rest, the Word made flesh, prophet, priest, and king, unto you we sing, Jesus, teacher, rabbi, with authority, state parables that enlighten our eyes, Jesus, of the pearl of great price, Mary's feast must be seen so accurate and Drop the seed and the sower to fill with hidden treasure. Then guard the laborers. Jesus, the light and the lamb. Jesus, the great I am. Jesus, on the dead his raise. The songs and the praise. Jesus, he reigns forever. Jesus, there will never be another. Jesus, the sure of the Messiah. The way, truth, and life. Say, blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Jesus, say to the world, you're a light, shining in the darkness, a city on the hill. Jesus, taught us how to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
was and is is to come Almighty, the first, the last, alive forevermore, the King of kings, the Lord of Lord Jesus. Alpha Jesus, Omega Jesus, and Jesus, which was and is is to come Almighty, the first, the last, alive forevermore, the King of King Jesus, the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus, Alpha, Omega, beginning and the end, which was and is, is the most almighty, the first, the last, the life, forevermore, the King of kings, the Lord of Lord Jesus, Alpha, Omega, beginning and the end, which was and is, is the most
is probably a pretty good time for you to stand to your feet and give the Lord the best praise you've given him all morning this morning. He is completely worthy of every praise, of every glory, of every adoration that you can heap upon him this morning. Lord, we bless your name together. We honor you in this house. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank God, thank God. Amen, amen, and amen. Thank you, guys. I appreciate that. Amen. Wow, would you let this choir know and musicians know? Amen. Our young ladies who did such a phenomenal job of leading us in worship through dance, I mean, my goodness, let them know how much you love them and, and appreciate them. I may be biased and, and fully aware of that, but my daughter, my goodness, uh, listen, I was just about to pass out watching her dance down here and then having to get up and sing after that. I don't know how you did it, amen, my goodness. Wow, wow. And if you're wondering what all of this is about, it's because we serve a risen Savior. That's why we're worshiping with such joy. That is why we celebrate with such incredible excitement and anticipation because we understand that our Jesus is alive forevermore. Amen. We understand there's an empty tomb that declares He's alive forevermore. Amen. Amen. And the resurrection is really what all this excitement is about. And I want to talk to you about the resurrection for just a few moments this morning. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up with me to the book of 1 Corinthians. The book of 1 Corinthians and chapter 15 is where we're going to find our text for this morning. And we're going to be talking about our risen Lord today. We're going to talk about uh, uh, our Savior who is resurrected from the dead, who is the first fruits of the resurrection. And why is that so important to us as Christians, as people of God? Why do we celebrate that in such an incredible way? Well, Paul writes to us in 1 Corinthians and tells us why we do that. In verse 1, we pick up reading and we read these words, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which you were also saved, if you hold fast to that word which I preached to you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And He was seen by Cephas and then by the twelve. After that He was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that He was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all He was seen by me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am. And His grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed." Now if Christ is preached that He has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. 
For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. Paul lays out the fact that if the resurrection is not factually correct, we're all in a lot of trouble. If the resurrection did not happen, then we are all in a mess and none of us have hope today. But thank God that an empty tomb testifies that we serve a risen Savior today. Amen. We're going to talk about that for a few moments. If you wouldn't mind, would you bow your heads with me all over this house? And we're going to pray together this morning. As you pray for me, I'm going to pray for you. Father, we love you today. Lord, I'm so grateful and so thankful for your love. So thankful this morning, Father, for the opportunity that we have to gather together in this house to worship you in this place. Lord, I thank you for, God, your presence in this place. And Father, you've already touched hearts and lives through our worship this morning. I pray for the next few moments that, God, you would anoint our hearts and our minds, touch our ears today. Let us receive the Word of God with readiness and with gladness. I pray that it would encourage your people, that it would strengthen our faith, that it would cut to the very heart of humanity today. And that, Father, we would see ourselves as you see us. That, Father, I pray today, God, that if there's one person here who does not know you, Jesus, as their Savior, that today would be the day that they receive salvation. We give you praise and glory and honor for that. For it's in the mighty and the wonderful, the holy name of Jesus that we pray together today. And amen and amen. God bless you as you're being seated this morning. The setting was Easter morning in 1799. The events occurred in Feldkirk, Austria, as Napoleon and his army were encamped outside of the city. The people inside were terrified. There was a feeling of anxiety that permeated the population of the city. They were anticipating certain death living terrified inside for they knew the reputation of Napoleon and his army and they were certain of what he would do when he breached the city walls. It is on that morning that the bishop of the local church said, this is Easter day. This is the day of our king's resurrection. We must have one moment of triumph at least. Let us at least ring all the bells of Easter to let this world know that Jesus is Lord and not Napoleon. What he was saying was simply the resurrection changes everything. It does not matter what comes and what goes upon this earth. It does not matter what kingdoms rise and what principalities rule. The fact of the matter is Jesus is alive. And because Jesus is alive, he sits as sovereign over all of humanity and over all of this world. Some would look at this morning and wonder why we as people would celebrate with such enthusiasm, would worship with such abandon. And the fact of the matter is it is not in a vacuum that any of that takes place. We worship with such enthusiasm. We give ourselves to embracing and adoration our God with such abandon because we serve a risen Savior this morning. The resurrection changes everything. Paul would write in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 concerning the resurrection of the Lord. And he leans upon his legal background as he launches into the narrative of chapter 15. He is building a case like any good lawyer would. He begins by listing the evidence as he talks about all of the eyewitnesses that beheld Jesus after his resurrection. 
He talks about the fact that Jesus was crucified, that Jesus hung upon the cross for our sins, that he was by necessity placed in that position to become the perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God slain from the foundations of the world because of our sin as he takes the sinfulness of humanity upon his shoulders. He becomes the propitiation of our sin, giving his life as ransom and rescue for the lives of humanity. He is placed in a borrowed tomb for a period of three days, and yet on that third day, Paul boldly declares that he rises from the dead. He lists off as factual evidence the eyewitness witnesses who behold Jesus after his resurrection, being so bold as to call them by name as if they were on the witness stand and declaring the veracity of the testimony in which he is giving in that moment. He also lists a great number of people that he chooses not to call by name, the 500 who behold Jesus and bear witness to his resurrection resurrection. He does all of that to confirm the faith of the church. Those who have not seen Jesus with their own eyes and yet still cling to the hope of the resurrection, who claim and cling to the blood as their only hope of escape from a life of sin and a future that is found in hell. It is that blood that Paul holds out as the only hope of humanity, the sacrifice of Jesus that he holds out as the only escape clause to God's righteous justice that would be handed out as recompense for sinfulness in life. Paul would talk about their faith and he would declare to them that this resurrection was their anchor for their faith. It was the anchor that allowed their faith faith to have life. He would tell them because of that anchor of the resurrection, your faith and your belief is not in vain in verse 2. The original Greek word that he uses there is an interesting word. It is aiki. It simply means to believe idly or without reason. To believe with really no reason to believe. It would be akin to believing in old wives tale that we tell sometimes here in the South. How, how many of you have heard those fables that we call wives' tales? We laugh at them sometimes because there's no reason to believe them. Paul says that's not what the resurrection is. This is not mythology. It is not some foreign concept. It is not just a tale to be told to children. While it may not be politically correct and we may have the media today that wants to deny the veracity of it. They can call us weak-minded for believing it, and they can discount the accounts of it. But can I tell you they have no argument for the central fact that there's an empty tomb that declares Jesus is alive this morning. Oh, hallelujah. Let me go ahead and tell you that if hell could produce a body, they would have done so by now. If the Roman government could have discounted the witnesses of the eyewitness people, they would have done so in that day and time. But the fact remains, there is no one who could contradict the eyewitness testimony. There is no evidence to refute the empty tomb. The fact of the matter is, Jesus, Jesus is alive forevermore, and regardless of what naysayer wants to discount it, regardless of how much hell would like to forget about it, Jesus still declares, I am the way, the life, and the truth, and there is no way to the Father except through me. Oh, somebody give him praise in this house. Hallelujah. You know, when you look at the resurrection, it shouldn't have taken anybody by surprise. The psalmist told us about it in Psalm 16, verse 10. 
He would go on to write, the psalmist would go on to write in Psalm 24, talking to us about the righteous king of glory, the resurrected Lord who would take back the keys to death, hell and the grave, who would invade hell itself. And the cry would go up, lift up your heads, you everlasting gates and be high and lifted up. The king of glory is coming in. The savior himself told about it in Matthew chapter 12 verses 38 through 40. Again in John chapter 2 verse 19. The resurrection was pictured before it ever took place in the Old Testament by Isaac in Genesis chapter 22 as we are, as see him as the promised son given as a sacrifice. Jonah saw it in his book. Matthew saw it in Matthew chapter 12 verse 38 through 40. Everywhere you look throughout the word of God, the resurrection is talked about, prophesied, it is reported, and yet it is fulfilled by one person only, and that is Christ the Lord. He is the first fruits of the resurrection. Paul says that if the resurrection's not true, we have no foundation for our belief and no foundation for our salvation. Paul says if the resurrection's not true, then faith has no place in the life of any believer. You can't live by faith if Jesus isn't alive. Paul says if the resurrection's not true, our preaching is vanity and a waste of time. Paul says if the resurrection is not true, our faith itself is vain and we are false witnesses because there can be no forgiveness nor any future for any of us. If the resurrection is not true, Paul says we might as well eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. But the fact of the matter is there's eternity to consider. The fact of the matter is because Jesus is alive and lives forevermore, you and I can too. The fact of the matter is because there's an empty tomb, there's hope of eternity in the presence of God. I'm so glad today we serve a risen Savior. Oh, hallelujah. Give him praise in this place. Thank God. You say, preacher, why are you so sure about all of that? Well, let me give you some evidence. As Jesus hung upon the cross... He makes a bold declaration by the events that take place that he is sovereign over creation. As he hangs upon the cross, he touches the sun, and the sun refuses to shine in sorrow over the death of the Son of God. The world falls dark, all because the Son of God is hanging upon the cross. Yet he is the eternal light of heaven, and becomes the light of all nations. It is as if God was saying, even though the sun be blotted out, you cannot extinguish the light of the world. Even though the sun refuses to shine, you cannot diminish the light of the world. You see, the Bible declares that even though there becomes a new heaven and a new earth, and even though this sun and this earth fade away with time in eternity, there will be a city that will need no sun because the Lamb of God will be the light of that city. Can I just go ahead and tell you that if Jesus holds dominion over creation, if Jesus holds dominion over all that we see, it is no way wonder that the word declares in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and without the word was nothing made that we behold. I'm telling you he is the God of all creation this morning. Not only is he sovereign over creation, he's sovereign over separation. You do realize that there was a day and time where none of what we've experienced today was possible. There was a day and time where you could not feel the presence of God and you couldn't experience the closeness of his presence that we have felt in this place today. 
You know, I'm so thankful. I just want to go ahead and put you on record and let you know it is not like this everywhere else in every other church in, in, in the world. Don't ever take for granted what God is doing here in Landmark. Because when you're in this place and you sense the presence of God and, and you sense God draw close in the midst of worship and all that we're doing, God is with us, friend. I'm telling you the presence of God inhabits the praises of his people. But it was not always that way. There was a day and time when in the sanctuary there was a veil separating God and man. You see, you and I would have never been allowed behind that veil. The high priest was the only one who could go behind the veil to the mercy seat, into the holy of holies, and experience the presence of God. And he could only do that one time a year as he took the blood offering in and sprinkled it on the mercy seat in propitiation for the sins of Israel. Oh, but thank God as Jesus hung upon the cross and he cried out, it is finished. The Bible says that in the sanctuary, in the temple, the veil that separated God and man was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. What does that mean? That means that you, that me, that every person who names the name of Christ and has been washed in the blood can march boldly before the throne of grace and find help in time of need because of the blood of the Lamb of God. Jesus dealt with the separation. He dealt with the over 1,500 years of separation between the holy of place and the holy of holies. And yet our high priest, Jesus, brings us into the presence of God anytime we desire by his sacrifice. Oh, somebody give him praise. Hallelujah. You see, I, I love what Paul writes. You know, I, I, I just have to put myself in his shoes sometimes. You see, he's been trained classically by the Pharisees. He's been trained classically in the law. He's a Hebrew scholar, and he knows what the Torah says. He knows what the law and the prophets say. He's well acquainted with the process of being separated from God. Matter of fact, he's embraced it for most of his adult life, and yet he has a vision of Jesus, and Jesus calls him to preach the gospel and in one afternoon, he goes from Saul the murderer to Paul the preacher. Oh, thank God. In one afternoon and in one encounter with Jesus, everything in his past that was dirty and broken and dysfunctional, everything in his past that was sin-stained and scarred and despicable, it was put under the blood of the Lamb of God and he had a new future all because of the blood of Jesus. Can you imagine going from a murderer to a preacher in one afternoon? And yet that's the power of the blood. You know, I believe that's why he wrote Romans chapter 7 and Romans chapter 8. If you could not read any other passages of Scripture out of the entirety of the Bible, if you read those two chapters, you'll understand the entirety of human existence and the amazing grace that can only be found through the blood of the Lamb of God. Paul writes in Romans 7, O wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from this body of death? He talks about the struggle of the flesh. The things I want to do, I don't do. I know to live right, but I don't live right. I'm battling this flesh and temptation all the time, and it seems like I'm losing the battle. But he comes to the conclusion of chapter 7, and he writes these words in prelude to chapter 8. Thanks be unto God who gives us the victory through Christ our Lord. Then he turns the page. And he writes verse 1 of chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in 
Christ Jesus, my God in heaven. I need to tell somebody today, it's time to turn the page in your life. I need to tell somebody this morning, you need to get out of the guilt and the condemnation of your past. You need to let it go. You need to put it under the blood. You need to forget about it. You need to quit dwelling on it. You need to quit allowing the devil to give you torment about it. Turn the page. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Oh, he writes so beautifully in chapter 8. There is no separation. Why? Because there's no condemnation. For what could separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus? Neither height nor depth, things present nor things to come, angels nor demons, principalities nor powers, oh, nor famine, nor nakedness, nor peril, nor sword. No, I am pursued. We are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. Oh, hallelujah. Thank God. Because there's no condemnation, there is no separation. He's the Lord who's sovereign over it. And because he's sovereign over separation... He's also sovereign over destruction. As Jesus is on the cross, there is an earthquake that hits the land. Devastation, destruction. It is as if hell is taking out its wrath and fury, not only on the Son of God on the cross, but also upon the earth. The earth shakes, the rocks rattle, but they did not know that Christ is the glue that holds it all together. You see, Jesus had said just a week prior to that, you see those rocks? If you don't cry out, they'll cry out for you. You see what the devil didn't understand was Jesus was the glue that held it all together anyway. You could kill him, but he still holds it together. You could take his life, he weighs, lays it down willingly, but he lays it down willingly so he takes it back up unto himself. And even though the devil would like to tear this world apart, there's a risen Savior who says, not any longer. You see, Jesus talked about the devil, and he said he's a thief who has come to steal, kill, and destroy. And yet Jesus, in his resurrection, declares he's sovereign over all destruction. You know, I'm just come by to let somebody know the devil can only do so much in your life. The devil only has so much rope in your life. The devil can only go so far in your life and do so much in your life. I know it seems like he's winning sometimes, but can I tell you there's still a bloodline that tells him he can't cross that and he can go this far, but no further. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying the devil is like a pit bulldog on a chain. He might run out and bark a little bit, and he might even strain at that chain, but the chain says you can only go this far, but no further. You want me to tell you the limitation of the devil? The Bible says in the book of Job that the devil went in front of God and accused Job and said, God, he's only serving you because you blessed him so much. He's only serving you because you've been good to him. But if you let me have my way with him, if you let me do my worst to him, he'll curse you and die. He'll give up on you, God. And you know what God said? God said, I'm going to let you go this far, but no further. I want somebody to get that in your spirit this morning. The God of heaven said, you can take everything he's got. You can ruin his health. You can even kill his children. But I'm going to draw a line in the sand and tell you you can't touch his life. And because I'm drawing a line in the sand there, 
you can go that far, but no further. That amazes me. Because we in the church sometimes want to view God and the devil as equal counterparts, one good, one evil. Let me tell you, there's nothing that could be further from the truth. The devil is not God's evil counterpart. The devil is a created being that God snatched up by the nape of the neck when he rebelled in heaven, kicked him out along with a third of the angels who rebelled against God in heaven and declared, you're going to eat the dust of the earth the rest of your life until I throw you in a lake of fire. You see, God is not worried about what the devil's doing. God is not worried about any plan that Satan has. God's not worried about anything that hell will unleash on this earth. May I tell you, Jesus declared he's sovereign over every destruction, over every evil. That's why the Bible says he came out of the tomb with the keys to death, hell, and the grave as a testimony that he is sovereign over every work over every power, over every principality. You ought to give him shout of praise in this house. My God in heaven. Not only did he declare he's sovereign over destruction, he declared he's sovereign over death. Do you realize Jesus was so powerful in life that he touched sepulchers and the dead came back to life? He spoke words into the air and people came out of tombs. Lazarus, come forth. He was so powerful in life that he didn't even have to go to people's houses. He just simply spoke words over their children and they came back to life. The Bible states the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and then those who are in their graves will be resurrected just as he was resurrected. My God in heaven, I feel the preach in this house this morning. That's why Paul would write in verse 55 of chapter 15, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, my Lord, do you get the feeling that's a common thread with Paul? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Christ. You see, Paul didn't have any answers for any of it. He didn't understand everything. He couldn't explain everything, but he knew from whom all blessings flowed. He knew that Jesus was the source of it all. So when Paul would get stuck and he wouldn't know what else to say, he'd just simply lift his hands and say, thanks be to God who gives us the victory in Christ Jesus. You know, I don't understand everything that God does. I don't know why we're walking in such a blessing, in such a season of blessing here at Landmark right now. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Christ Jesus. I don't know why my four children love Jesus the way that they do and how come they're still serving the Lord. There have been plenty of times I failed as a father, that I blew it, that I could have messed up their lives, but here they are our loving Jesus. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Christ Jesus. I don't know why my wife still hangs out with me and hasn't walked away after all these years, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. I don't know why any of the good things are in my life that are there, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Christ Jesus. You see, you don't have to have all the answers. You just got to know Jesus. And so when Jesus comes out of the tomb, he is declaring himself as sovereign over death. Therefore, not even death holds terror for the child of God anymore. Paul talks about this sting of death, and I'm reminded of a story I heard one time. There was a family that was going on family vacation. It was back in the day when you used to roll the windows down. We don't roll windows down much anymore, do we? We like air conditioning. That's okay. I like air conditioning. Big folks like me like air conditioning. That's why I was comfortable outside this morning. Big folks like me like that. Run it down cold. But this was the day and time when they'd roll down the windows. And you got mom and dad in the front seat and There's little Susie and little Johnny in the back seat. 
They're going on family vacation. As they roll down the road, all of a sudden, a wasp flies into the car. Bedlam ensues. The wife is screaming. The kids are diving under the seat. Dad's trying not to have a wreck going down the interstate. He's not sure what to do when all of a sudden the only thing he can think of to do is reach out his hand and he grabs the wasp out of the air. I mean a karate kid moment. Daniel son. Karate's not in the heart, it's in the hand. <laughs> you like that, didn't you? I mean, it's not like quoting Beyonce on a Sunday morning, but it's good, right? <laughs> he holds the wasp in his hand for a few moments, and all of a sudden he turns the wasp loose, and all the calm that had happened because he had the wasp in his hand now dissipates, and everybody's screaming again. Kids are under the seat, the wife's having a panic attack, and he looks over at him and he says, wait a minute, calm down. You don't have to be scared of that wasp anymore. I want you to look at my hand right here. You see right there? There's his stinger. And without his stinger, he can never hurt you. Oh, did you hear what I said? Paul says, oh, death, where is your sting? Can I tell you, Jesus took the sting of death. You don't have to be afraid of death anymore. Your last breath on this earth is your next breath in eternity. Death holds no terror for the child of God. It's simply the graduation day that we enter into eternity. Oh, somebody ought to give them praise in this house. Last thing, not only is he sovereign over death, he's sovereign over sin. As Jesus hangs upon the cross, there's a Roman soldier who is there. More than likely, it is one of the same Roman soldiers that had beaten Jesus. More than likely, we don't know for sure, but more than likely, it is one of the same legion of soldiers that had slapped Jesus in the face and said, prophesy to us, tell us which one of us hit you. Perhaps, we don't know for sure, it might have been even one of the soldiers that wielded the whip that beat Jesus. We're not sure of any of those things. All we know is that there's a Roman soldier there at the foot of the cross, positioned and stationed. And as he looks up at Jesus... After Jesus has exhibited authority and dominion over everything we've just talked about, he looks at Jesus and says, Surely that's the Son of God. He didn't pray any elaborate prayer. There wasn't anything that was theologically sound about it, but there was a declaration that surely... He's the Son of God. Can I tell you, I believe that was enough to take him from the foot of the cross all the way to eternity in the presence of God. That's how much power the blood of the Lamb has over sin in life. This military leader who had no doubt crucified scores of men over the years, yet when he saw the sun refuse to shine and he heard the veil had been written to and the earth began to shake, he saw the dead coming out of Jerusalem. He shouted, Jesus, surely he's the son of the living God. Can I tell you, it doesn't matter how sin-scarred your past is. It doesn't matter what your sin looks like. It doesn't matter what anybody else has to say about it. Just one drop of the blood of the Lamb of God will wash away every sin in your life. There's no misdemeanors and felonies in the kingdom of God. Sometimes we view sin in different lenses, but can I tell you all sin? Turn to your neighbor and tell them all sin. All sin, every sin. 
all sin has a penalty of death. Romans 3.23 tells us the wages of sin is death. There's no way around that, friend. There's no loophole. There's not any argument you can make to say God understands this sin or God understands that or, or God's okay with me. Sin is sin. Any sin, whether it's big or little or ugly or one of the ones we like to, to harp on, none of that matters to God. All sin brings recompense and judgment. And yet it is Christ on the cross who cries out, it is finished. And he declares it is finished with the word to telestai. And that word I shared this Friday night literally means it is finished and it always will be. It means that there will never be a time hell will be able to overcome the blood of the Lamb. There will never be a time that Satan will be able to, able to discount what Jesus did at the cross. If his blood was shed then and it forgave sin then, it will forgive sin right now in this present day. And what the resurrection really is, it's just the receipt that we hold that says the bill has been paid in full. That's all the resurrection is. It says, you know what? My sin was placed on his tab and he paid it in full at the cross. He shed his blood to take away my sin-stained life. And my sin stains, even though they were scarlet, they became white as snow washed in the blood of the Lamb of God. Paid in full this morning. Oh, you ought to give God praise. I'm telling you. Your sin is gone. He's sovereign over it. You know, Brother Jack, I learned a long time ago, you don't have to embellish the most perfect story ever told. I used to try to come up with a new way to preach it every single year, but I came to the place where I realized Jesus and Him crucified and resurrected from the dead is all the embellishment that I need. It's preaching Christ and Him crucified. Salvation, that's all it is, folks. And yet that's why we celebrate. That's why we have joy in life. We're people of the resurrection. We're people who know what it is to be washed in the blood this morning, cleansed from all unrighteousness, to have our bill paid in full. If you didn't realize it, that was an amen from her. She says, I'm training her right. Thank God. Baby girl, you shout with your papa all you want to. I'm so glad this morning that Jesus paid it in full. There's an old song that we used to sing in the church, all to Jesus I surrender. All to Jesus I freely give. I don't know about you, friend, but that's the greatest decision I ever made was to give all of me to Him. All the good, all the bad, all the ugly, everything. And just give it to him. And Jesus says, I'll take it all. I'll take everything that you are, everything you've ever done, and there will be grace sufficient to give you a new future, a new life in Christ. This morning, if you're here and you're sitting here and you're listening to this preacher preach about the resurrection and the grace of God and the mercy of God that was shown at the cross and you're wondering pastor could that ever be me you don't know where I've been you don't know what I've done you don't know how awful I've been let me just go ahead and tell you you're surrounded by people who all thought that same thing at one point in time in their lives every single person in this building today they wondered Lord could you ever forgive somebody like me Lord could you ever take care of the sin in my life as ugly as it is could you ever really love somebody like me? And the answer to every single person in this building was yes. I could do every bit of that for you. You see, you're no different than anybody else in this room. 
we are just simply a bunch of sinners who have been saved by grace, who have been given a new lease on life through Christ Jesus, and we're new creatures through the grace and the mercy of God this morning. That's our testimony. That's who we are. We don't have anything that you don't have <laughs> except the grace of God. And this morning, I just want to tell you that no matter who you are, no matter where you've come from, no matter what you've done, God loves you and His grace is sufficient for you in your life this morning. His forgiveness will make all the difference in your life this morning. And we're going to pray together here in just a moment. I want to give you the opportunity this morning, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, or you're not living for Him right now, to make that decision. It's the greatest decision you'll ever make in your life this morning. And as every head is bowed and every eye closed all over this sanctuary, for those of you watching online, for those of you that are here in the house, we're going to pray together all over this house this morning. Would you bow your heads and pray with me right now? Heavenly Father, I freely admit that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. I freely admit that there is nothing that I can do to save myself. I rely completely upon your grace, your mercy, and the sacrifice of Jesus. I freely admit that He came to this earth. He was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He died upon the cross for me and that He rose from the dead. Based on those facts, I ask you now to forgive me of all my sins, of all my failures, of all my shortcomings. Take me just like I am and make me what you want me to be. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. I live for you now. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now as every head is still bowed and every eye closed, if you prayed that prayer this morning for the very first time or perhaps in recommitting your life to Christ today, would you just slip your hand up and back down again real quick? I just want to pray for you this week. Is there anybody here? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Hallelujah. Well, thank God. That's six lives this morning. Can we just give God praise in this house? Thank God. Thank God, thank God. I'm so glad that Jesus paid the price for me, that he paid it all. Listen to me as your pastor. Just listen to me for a moment. The devil's going to try to tell you that Jesus could never do that for somebody like you. And let me go ahead and tell you, if Jesus did it for me, if Jesus did it for these other people in this room, he'll do it for you as well. Don't you ever allow the devil to torment you about your past again. Don't you ever allow the devil to make you feel like somehow a second-class citizen of the kingdom of God. You're a child of the king. Amen? God loves you with an everlasting love. As a matter of fact, there's not one thing you could ever do to make God love you less. He loves you eternally. Let's stand together all over this house. Thank God. Aren't you glad we serve a risen Savior this morning? I'm so thankful that Jesus is alive. I'm so thankful today that we have the hope of the resurrection. This morning, if you made that prayer today, your prayer, if you made that choice today, to either give your life to Christ for the first time or recommit your life to Christ, you're watching online, here's a few things that I just want to leave you with. Number one, find somebody to tell exactly what you did this morning. It's important. Jesus said about that fact that if you're ashamed of me on earth, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father in heaven. We testify to it publicly. Our evangelism team is going to be out in the foyer at the guest information table, and they'd love to celebrate that fact with you. So if you want to tell them, that would be absolutely fantastic. They'd love for you to come by and share that news with them. If you're watching online, just send us an email or a Facebook message. Make a comment on the video. We'll be praying for you. We'd love to celebrate that wonderful news with you. Number two, we have what we call our first steps packet. We'd love to put in your hands. Our evangelism team has that at the table outside. They'll 
get that in your hands. It's a, just a brief guide of how to live for Jesus. Amen. It tells you how to take those next steps in your life of faith. Number three, get baptized. Why? Jesus said it was important, right? And if Jesus said it was important, we probably need to pay attention to that. We are crucified with Him. And we were raised with Him. It was an outward sign of an inward work of grace. Number four, find a great Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church and fasten yourself in that. Make that your home. Make it a place where you use your talents and abilities for the glory of God. We think Landmark's probably the best place on earth that you could ever do that. Amen? But there are a lot of great churches, there are a lot of great pastors, a lot of great congregations. Find one, make it your home, and use your talents and abilities for the glory of God. One of the great things about being saved is now that you're forgiven, now that you're part of the kingdom of God, you have the privilege of celebrating the Lord's Supper. And we're going to do that right now as we conclude this service. You should have been given the articles of communion on your way in this morning. And as you have those in your hand, if you did not get those, if you'll raise your hand and our ushers will make sure that they come to you. Ushers, if you'll prepare to wait on those who have their hands up, raise your hand, keep it up. We're going to make our way to you. A lot of the choir members, I think, didn't get that when they were in the choir loft. And so, we want to make sure we take time to get those handed out. Our ushers are coming. We've got some folks over here on this side. We've got some people over here. Just keep your hand up. We'll make sure we get to you. We want to make sure that you get that. If you're in the balcony, I know some folks in the balcony don't have those. We'll make sure we get those to you. When you get those, just hang on to them. I'm going to give you instructions here in just a moment. Anybody else that needs the articles of communion, we want to make sure you get those. Thank you, brethren. I appreciate your assistance with that. One of the great blessings as a child of God is to partake in the Lord's Supper, an ordinance of the church with other believers. Communion is not for the non-believer. Matter of fact, the Bible gives us express warning about receiving communion unworthily, living in sin or not saved. You don't, you don't take communion if you're not saved. But being saved and being a part of the family of God allows us to celebrate the body and the blood. And this morning, as you take your cup, peel back the foil on top, the cellophane on top, and, and take the wafer in your hand, and then peel back the foil on the cup, and just leave it open there. I'm going to give you some instructions here in just a moment. Jesus, just prior to His death on the cross, gathered with His disciples in the upper room, and he talked with them about what would take place in the coming hours, what would happen when he would go to the cross. And he instituted what, was, what we now call the Lord's Supper. And as he did so, he gave them instructions. He took bread, he blessed bread, he broke it, and he gave it to them. And prophetically speaking, he instructed them that this was his body that would be broken for them. And he told them to take and eat it, and as often as they would do so, to remember the body that would be broken for their sins, the body that would be broken for them. And this morning, as you take and eat of the wafer, remember the body of Christ that was broken for you today. Take and eat. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Then he took the cup and he passed it amongst them. And he told them that as they would drink of this cup, that it would become the sign and the symbol of the new covenant, the blood of Jesus that was shed for the remission of sin. That word remission is a wonderful word that he used. It's not just the covering of sin. It's the cancellation of sin. It's not just putting a band-aid on a problem. 
It's removing it completely. And that's what the blood of the Lamb did in your life and in my life. You as a child of God stand before the Lord completely justified, meaning that he, when He looks at you, He doesn't see any of your past. He doesn't see any sin. He doesn't see any failure in your life. It's gone because of the blood of the Lamb of God. And as you take and drink of the cup this morning, do so in remembrance of the blood of Jesus that was shed for the remission of sin. Take and drink this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we bless your name today. Why don't you just lift your hands and just for about 30 seconds, just pour your praise out on him. Just bless his name and let's give him glory today. Let's thank him today for the forgiveness of the blood of the Lamb of God. Lord, we thank you today. We give you glory and praise and honor today. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank God, thank God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know, I'm so thankful as we celebrate this weekend that the events of Friday could never overshadow the events of Sunday. That the events of Friday, while a necessary part of God's plan, are devoured by the victory of an empty tomb. This morning, we're people of the resurrection. How many of you are glad today that Jesus changes everything? Amen. Thank God. Thank God. Jesus changes everything. God bless you this morning. If you'll allow me the honor and the privilege of praying for you as we're dismissed today, I hope you have an incredible rest of your day. Spend it with family and remembering the blessings and the benefits of the resurrection, the fact we serve a risen Savior today. Let's pray. Father, I love you. God, I'm so grateful and thankful for your love. I'm so thankful this morning, God, that there's an empty tomb that declares we serve a risen Savior. There's an empty tomb that declares Jesus is alive forevermore. And Lord, today we as people of the resurrection can testify to the fact that Jesus changes everything. Lord, I pray for your people as we go our separate ways today that you would go with them and keep them and camp your angels round about them. Overshadow them with grace and with mercy. Bless them in their rising up and bless them in their going down. I pray that you would cause your face to shine upon them. Lift up your countenance upon them. Bless them with peace. Bring us back safely at the appointed time. And Father, it's in the mighty and the wonderful, the holy name of Jesus that we pray together today. And amen and amen. God bless you today. Go with God this morning. Amen. 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 If you have your 30 pieces of silver offering, if you will uh, bring that to Sister Esther, or you can leave that out front in the foyer. Uh, we'll make sure all of that goes directly to the rescue house that we are supporting as a ministry. God bless you.